welcome to our September work meeting. And I'm going to call this meeting to order. And I'm going to begin by asking Ms. Anaya to read the Open Public Meetings Act statement, please. On Thursday, January 14, 2021, notice of this meeting was mailed to the press and the current of Egg Harbor Township. Notice was also delivered that day to the Egg Harbor Township clerk and posted on a bulletin board in Township Hall. Thank you. May we have roll call? Ms. Alabarda? Here. Mrs. Bird? Mr. Delabarca? Here. Mr. Ireland? Here. Mr. Price? Here. Here. Here? Here. <laughs> Mrs. Sullivan? Here. Mrs. Salagi? Here. And Mr. Castellano? No, Dread. Here. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Gilbert Floyd is here. Sorry about that. I had you absent earlier. Thank you. That's okay. Here. Okay, we're all going to uh, stand and salute the flag, following which I'm going to ask all of you to join me in a moment of silence. We have lost three current and former bus drivers, Roberta Bergeron, Maureen Milton, and Richard Edwards. So again, welcome. Thank you for coming out to our September work meeting. So welcome back, EHT. Uh, I want to start uh, again, as I do very often. I want to thank our administration. I want to thank our teachers. And I want to thank our staff, all of our staff. For the first time in two years, we are back 100% in person and full time. And it took a lot to get there. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of work and dedication for that to happen. We know there were issues. We know there are issues associated uh, with doing something we haven't done in two years. Some circumstances have changed uh, and that made it more difficult. Um, and you'll be hearing uh, tonight measures we've taken to mitigate and make things better and get us back on track. But Again, the most important thing is we are back. So welcome back, EHT. Uh, thank you all again. And I'm going to turn uh, the microphone over to our superintendent, Dr. Gruccio. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our work session. It's great to be back. I welcome everybody back. And I have to say how happy it I am and how nice it feels to have everyone back full time in person in our schools. Um, we are aware uh, that we've had some blips here and there um, with this opening, but overall it's been a great opening. Um, we've addressed concerns or in, and are in the process of addressing um, some concerns, and I'll share um, some information with you tonight. I even have a visual for you, but I'm going to provide some facts to our school community and our Board of Education. Uh, masks are to be worn in our schools for our students and staff as per Executive Order 2. Five, one. Yes, there are mask exemptions in that executive order and all that are stated are adhered to by us. We have provided desk shields in our classrooms as per the road forward where stated in the road forward that structural interventions can be put in place when needed. And in our case, when there's more than 20 students and three feet of social distance cannot occur in the classroom. Last year, this time, we, we were challenged as to why we didn't have desk shields. For, and they would help open our schools. Well, here we are a year later, we had death shields, and we are proud that we are opening our school with all our students back. Um, they are assisting us when we cannot social distance, and they also act as another protective layer against COVID-19. And these uh, answers questions that parents had who were concerned about sending their students back in the building. So that extra layer assured them that we are um, working uh, to keep our schools safe See, keep our students healthy and our buildings open. We've heard some, also heard some, from some of our teachers, and we listened to our teachers. You know, after we opened up, some requested desk shields 
Um, they request, just as they requested other PPE um, devices, and those requests were fulfilled. Last year, we were able to remove desks, beh uh, masks behind desk shields, and you know that, that seemed logical, but at this time, we cannot. Um, but just think when we can, and hopefully we move um, into that um, ability to do that, we feel prepared because we have desk shields in place. We also have table shields in our cafeteria tables, and students can remove their masks here to eat. And this is the road, part of the road forward guidance um, that we are following. And perhaps that could be confusing for some. Uh, perhaps that's because maybe in, uh, during lunch, uh, first of all, they have to eat and remove their masks. And some don't, some, some do this, and that, that's up to them. But um, you know, our students are in the cafeteria much, much shorter time than they are with each other in the classrooms. Overloaded buses. Um, some of you received a phone call from transportation, and they advised you of a, that we are looking to implement or we are implementing a more efficient pickup and drop off um, in one neighborhood in particular. There were five bus routes, five buses that were going into that neighborhood. So we had to adjust and were able to put um, two Edgar Township school buses uh, solely for that neighborhood. I want to make uh, it clear and I want to clarify that there were not 70 students assigned to one bus. Okay, we received the report. And that there were also multiple students sitting in one seat. We addressed that. Um, there happened to be a substitute bus driver that day. They didn't follow the, the seating chart, but um, that was addressed. And simply, we are looking to be efficient and effective in all that we do. Regarding other school districts, I sit here as superintendent of the Acover Township School District. I collaborate with my colleagues in Atlanta County. Um, and especially with one superintendent in particular, and I've been assured that all students and staff are to wear masks in the public schools in Atlantic County. Um, can students in those districts take their masks off behind desk shields? Absolutely not. All my colleagues are following the road forward in the executive order and the guidance that guides us as superintendents of schools. So I hope that this clarifies any misinformation. Water filling stations. Um, yes, I want to make it clear that our pandemic team meetings had discussions about the health, safety, and welfare of our student staff uh, regarding multiple areas and water filling stations and um, water fountains were a discussion. And I also shared in my plan at our town hall meeting that we held in August, as well as information on the website and at every board meeting since that we have a health and safety plan in place. This, and we have pandemic teams in place. Pandemic teams are a consensus of stakeholders collaborative, uh, who collaborate and discuss um, certain issues regarding the road forward. Um, we were informed that one of our water stations were, was open and that was unbeknownst to us. Um, aside from this incident, we also heard that there's a request, a request from parents and from students um, for the willing water stations to be open. So today, because I, I, I received um, positive feedback, um, we got in touch with our school physician and asked his opinion about water fountains versus the filling stations. And he gave us guidance on water fountains um, where he does not recommend, and we still will you know, agree with him on that, the water fountains um, can be havens for, for germs. But he did, we did talk about the, um, the water filling stations. So um, he, his advice to us was that they're not as um, uh, dangerous, if you will, for germ um, infestation and recommended that if we would like to open the water filling stations that we, we you know, would do so and he would support that in terms of the health, safety, and welfare of students. Um, so we anticipate by the end of this week that they will be open throughout our schools and also know that there are cases of water available for our students um, who would like to, to have water and not use a willing water station or maybe their own water bottles have ran out of water. Um, I know in fact that this building has a case of water in every classroom. Lastly, drop off and pick up at Swift Slayball. We are aware of the traffic backup uh, to the point where my whole central office staff has been out um, uh, in the on the corners on the sidewalks. Um, we also got I also got in touch with the Egg Harbor Township Police Department. The chief's been here two or three days along with Sergeant Graham, and they've evaluated the situation. We've met with the principals, with transportation, with facilities director, 
um, and, and we discussed um, our situation. And it's got, while it's gotten a little better, um, we still need a plan to improve it. And as I shared with the board uh, members in committee settings, that we, Mr. Brunetta has worked on a plan and submitted that plan. So we I could get that up on the... So I'd like to show the Board of Education and the public um, the plan that we're going to uh, review with the Swift Slave Ball leadership team tomorrow. We met with Mrs. Wazen today and shared uh, this plan with her. Jamie, I'll need the light probably dim. Um, I also have a meeting set up with the Egg Harbor Township um, um, administrator, township administrator, because this involves some assistance from the township. But I want you to show that I wanted you to know that we are aware. We have reacted and we are in a planning process and I'd like to get this project on its way as soon as possible to have the board's blessing um, in terms of what we're looking to do. All right, so um, Mr. Santilli, if you could be Vanna White, if you will, because I usually don't come down to work sessions. Do I have a, where's that? Here, is that here? There we go. All right, so if you can follow me. Where am I? 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 Yeah. Stephen, I want to hold this up though. <laughs> All right, so we're going to pull in here. What we're looking to do is um, put arrow markers on the, on the road coming in. So, okay, so this is the entrance of Swift Drive. Here's your um, Swift School. Um, sleigh balls. I'm sorry. Why, why is it backwards? Can I do it this way? You guys can see this. Come right here. Right. It's not upside down. So what we're looking to do is come in to the complex here. This is. Uh, or Ocean Heights, you're going to come in, and we're going to have road markers. We're going to have um, road markings and signs. So what we need to do, board, is we're looking to put a driveway in between the baseball field there and the playground. So that'll come in around Swift. All right. So we will have be able to have a parent drop off and pick off in this area for this school. What we have to do now is move the playground from behind Swift and over to that baseball area there, softball area. The, go ahead, move to the right. This parking lot, which exists in front of Slay Ball, would be expanded to now be a bus parking lot. So what we're trying to create here is the bus drop off and pick up for the buses to be in between the two schools, all right? So kids aren't, right now what our buses are doing is they're picking up at the two schools and then they're swapping, all right, and then they're leaving. That's why some folks are getting home um, a little later. So we are trying to resolve that situation, have a centerized um, bus lot so that both schools can be served, all right. What that does now is put parent drop off and pick up to the back of the school, the back of uh, sleigh ball, we have to break through this parking lot here, which is the existing parking lot for the sleigh ball primary staff and some of the sleigh ball elementary staff. And then by doing that, we have to create 53 more spaces here so they can accommodate some of the parking that we're taking away in these two spots. So we feel that this will uh, be, this will alleviate the problem. Uh, we met, like I said, with the PD today. They, they like the plan. Some of it was their ideas and their recommendations as well as Mr. Brunetta, who drew this up for us. Um, what we do know, what we have to get permission from the township is we have to, this is their property here, we have to expand this road maybe about a foot here, but our property, we know that we can move the fences back and come in onto here, okay? So we'd like to get this moving um, as soon as we can. It involves um, a discussion with the township and it involves um, a discussion with whoever we, we can bid this out to. Okay. Any questions? Just to confirm, it's a draft plan. It is a draft plan. Go ahead plan. and yep. Yep. talk okay. to individuals. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, sure. Sure. I have a question. 
How right. soon are we looking at implementing this? What is the cost? And um, right, that's what we're looking into. We now. don't know at this point. We don't know. We don't know the cost. We have to have some discussions again with the with the township. What they can do, what they can't do, that would add. Okay, so that so in other words, okay, all right, okay, thank but you. But I wanted to show you hot off the press um, what we've been brainstorming about and what we're looking to do to resolve the situation, um, the headache that I know parents are experiencing right now. And you know, I want to call the word this morning. What happened here, particularly the other day, that rainy day, um, you had um, first day of school, parents are excited. Sorry, parents excited. You have the little kids, you know, that parents are walking in, taking pictures, whatever, you know. And then we have COVID, right? And some, some parents don't uh, want their their um, students on the buses, and and I respect that. I understand that. Um, originally, when this district um, had, you know, opened up the second and third schools here, back before the situation we're in right now. Yeah, you know, we made a firm stance. We're a we're a busing district. Take the bus, okay? Um, but I'm not going to sit here and say that in the current situation that we are in in a world pandemic. Um, I understand. I'll sit here and say I understand. So to accommodate the overflow of of traffic and parent drop off and pick up, um, I I think this is going to help alleviate. Um, the backup that we're having, if you will, particularly in the front there, when that Swift School drop off, it takes, we call it the queuing area, the line of cars. Instead of being backed up on Ocean Heights Ave, we can pull them into our own property and the, the cars could start lining up there. Yes. So I am glad to see that there's, um, you know, a, a plan or a tentative plan draft in place. So I was just wondering until um, that this plan seems extensive with um, construction and different things and partnering with different with the township and different things so until like until that happens right now like the um, I guess what's the plan like to alleviate some of it now do we have like a little like a temporary one that we could repattern the traffic or anything or is it just going to well, right now we're doing the best we can gotcha. with having um, off, uh, security guards out there okay. and, and directing traffic and, um, you know, t having parents understand when they're dropping off, dropping off on the, the, the passenger side okay. and the okay. teachers on the curb helping the students you know, out, the a student car lane. And then the, okay. the, the, the car would drive, the parent would drive, you know, drive off and the next parent would pull up. And, and that's going on now. It's, okay. it's happening quicker and quicker every day. Mm -hmm. But I, I just feel like we can accommodate um, more cars in a safer, okay. you know, uh, arena, if you will, um, by, by putting in those two roads. So one road is going to be, or roadway, I should say, is going to be right there up front um, between the baseball field and the playground. And then the next one will split the parking lot over down at primary, mm -hmm. at um, Slayville Primary. And I know dropping off younger children is a um, a lot more is a lot more to dropping off a, a younger student at a school than it would be for older students getting on and off the buses. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Part of the parent drop off. Right, and then at the primary uh, where the preschool is, we, the ch the parents will have the opportunity to to park like they do now and walk their students in. Okay, because that's what's going on now. It's a little different with the preschool. So do um so this guess is my question. So um. Are the majority of parents parking and dropping off their walking in their preschool student, or do we have a car? Can we have a car lane for the the preschool students to be dropped off? I think we ha we have both. Of, we have both. Is it yeah both? Okay. Yeah, Mrs. Burke. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the fact that you guys have been so reactive and have come up with a plan, very thorough plan. I've discussed with the township, also um, police chief. So that's a wonderful job. Um, I am alarmed at the scope of this solution, uh, the costs that are going to be involved in this solution. When we, the problem is somewhat short term right now. We're hoping that things do at some point go back to normal. So it, it almost seems like we're going to be putting a lot of district funds out to fix a problem that 
God willing, is a temporary one. Uh, and secondly, in the future, if we redistrict, we're putting a lot of resources here to fix a parking flow issue that may not be an issue in the future at some point if we ever switch the schools around a little bit. But mostly, have we considered staggering drop-off times at these buildings so that, say, you know, let, you know, last names, A through, A through G, you drop off between these times, G through this, you drop off and spreading it out to, you know, help with the flow there. How, have we come up with solutions that don't involve breaking ground right now? We have explored many options um, to the point where you can ask Mrs. Waza, and we tried one on Monday that didn't work, um, moving kids instead of, of buses. We, we, this complex has became, become second to the high school um, in terms of um, students in one spot. Um, if anything, our preschool building is going to expand. So if I had to sit here and say strategic plan as I look three to five years out, um, I would predict that that preschool is going to expand, right? We're, we're looking for more grant money. We're looking to grow that program. So there may be even addition put on, onto that, that building. Um, again, something we'll discuss in the strategic plan process. Um, I think we have outgrown the parking lot um, at, at Slave Hall Primary Elementary uh, to the point where I don't like that parents have to park way down and they're walking their little kids through when there's people kind of pulling in to get to work or pulling out to go someplace. So I think this presents a safer um, outline or for, for our community, for our schools. When I met with the chief of police, um, he even stated, he said, I've been here long enough um, to know that there used to be one school here right, the Swift School, and one way in, one way out, that worked at that time, and there used to be something that went through, a road that went through Veterans Memorials Park, that because when Castle Park was built, was shut down, so we don't have that one way, you know, an in and an out anymore, um, and his overview of it was, like, you know, there really wasn't much thought about parking and pick up and drop off as these buildings have been added. And he feels that, you know, we've updated, if you will, um, the complex and the facilities. So I understand your, your concern and your points are, 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 you know, well taken in terms of the pricing. Um, we're hoping some of this um, we, can, we can help um, do ourselves, but that's something, again, this is hot off the press today. I received it today. But it's something that, you know, we'll take into consideration um, the price, the process, and, and all that. And I will be in direct communication with you to let you know how we're, how we're pro progressing with this. And in the end, yes, you know, if, if, if we decide that, you know, it's, we, we might want to hold off, um, you know, that's a decision you know, that, that we have to live with. But I, I will tell you, um, it's, it's, it's hectic out there in the morning. So I'd like to make it clear cut, particularly with the, the um, roadway markings and the signage and just give people direct places uh, to go and where, the, where they need to go. Question. Ms. Alabarda, then uh, Mr. Ireland. So I'm a proud graduate of uh, Slave Ball Middle School. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there was a lot less traffic back then. Um, I am concerned, though, that we already have a lot of backup going on, and the construction would cause a lot more backup. So I'm not sure if that this is something we really want to consider doing during the school year or holding off to do it maybe during the summer. Mr. Ireland. Dr. Gershaw, you mentioned about safety on the um, in front of Swift, possibly the shoulder in front of Swift, the asphalt to the grass area, is there a way that we could fill that in with a little bit more dirt? So when I went to go um, pick up my son from school, I noticed that there was a couple cars parked because they couldn't get to the grass area or to the, the shoulder of the road. So if you wanna, um, I don't know, do you have a pointer? Swift. Yes, to the right. 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 Keep going, keep going, right there. So. 
So right there, a lot of cars were parking in the middle of the asphalt because they couldn't get further to the shoulder because there was huge like craters. If possible, can we get with the township or us to fill in those little craters just for the time being? Right, and that's part of our meeting with the township because okay. we, we have that all along there. We were hoping we can get another yeah. foot, foot and a half. Um, but again, that's a discussion we have to have with them to see. Because that should be a quick fix. Who's gonna touch it, who's gonna do it. Yeah. So, but That'd thank you. Yep, be a quick fix. Any, anyone else before I go back back to Mrs. Bird? Thank you. I know the finance department uh, had a discussion last month in August about pilot funds that the township collects on some redevelopment. This would be a great time to approach that on uh, maybe getting some sidewalks built around our schools and using some of those pilot funds to um, you know share with the district because that would uh, that would help all of the taxpayers at the drop off. And I think that that would be, this is a good time to approach that in our, as we work together to make things better. Agree. Any other comment? We good? Okay, well, I will keep you updated on that. And I just want, I want to say a reminder, to, to, there's a district newsletter that is uh, put out every Monday, it provides information not only from uh, the district perspective, but at the very end, you can, there's every school has, their, has a link to their district newsletter. Our website also provides information. And I encourage you that if you have a question, that a direct email, uh, first to a teacher, then to a principal, and to, to my office if, if need be, uh, we'll get you factual information that, that you need um, to either relieve anxiety or bring clarity to your concern or your question. Um, I, I do, again, uh, make a statement that Facebook conversations will not provide you with factual information as to how this school district runs. So while I appreciate feedback, and I, and I take it all day long, and it only makes us better at what we do, I encourage you to be, um, and stay positive, because um, it's very important to me and to the folks in the school district here and our climate and culture um, that, that we are positive. We are positive with our, our questions and our concerns and we are here to help, okay? And we are here to clarify when we need to clarify. Um, so I just wanna make sure you make that statement that we are communicating through our website. We, we will communicate um, through the parent portal and we will communicate um, through the district newsletter. And with that, Mr. Castellano, that concludes my September work session um, superintendent's report. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gruccio and uh, our administration. Uh, we'll be looking forward to more details uh, on the plan uh, as well as our uh, cost estimates, uh, and then we can make uh, an informed judgment going forward. Uh, but we appreciate the effort uh, that's going into uh, Make, making coming to school easier. Um, all right, um, so we are going to move forward now into our discussion of finance and operations. Um, and I'm going to ask for our committee report, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. I think I have the uh, mic. <laughs> um, the Finance and Operations Committee met on September 9th of 2021 at six o'clock at this boardroom. And myself, Mr. Price, Ms. Sullivan, Ms. Salaji, Ms. Anaya, Mr. Santilli, and Dr. Gruccio were in attendance. Uh, we discussed a couple of things, uh, committee updates, uh, transportation, the monthly update. It was all linked to the Google Drive, so you can follow along with that if you haven't already, board members. Um, the committee spoke highly of the transportation department and the hard work and dedication of the drivers and staff. We discussed uh, district charter, non-pub, special ed, parent contract uh, data. There are currently eight runs that are being contracted for the district students. And there remains to be an ongoing effort of recruitment to bring those runs in-house. And, and this data will be reported monthly. Um, facilities. Uh, Administration reported on ongoing projects, including uh, the well closure and the swift window bids. Uh, the high school ceiling. Administration reported an update on the high school gym. The ceiling paint is chipping and causing debris uh, that's falling, and uh, 
We'll be looking for current pricing and a recommendation will follow. So that, that's, if you're familiar with the gym, it, the ceiling is chipping, so that's something that has to be addressed. Uh, PPE update, personal protective equipment update. WB Mason agreed to cover the cost of our employees going to Michigan to pick up the cafeteria barriers, which were unable to be delivered due to the hurricane. So that was uh, very nice and well put together and we got that accomplished. Thank, thank you very much um, to the administration for that. Food service, the district is currently accepting applications for free and reduced lunch. Um, although breakfast and lunch are free for all students this year, there are significant benefits eligible for eligible families such as free SATs, AP testing, as well as PEBT funded cards and the school benefits and federal state funding to supplement our local budget. So that's something we need to be aware of. Uh, we discussed the district radios, the communications radios, um, data function charges. Um, Mr. Centilli and Ms. Anaya discussed the history of the radio purchases. The purpose of the district-wide communication and how deployment and inventory of the radios are maintained. The committee discussed coverage and the purchase of additional radios um, that were added to our existing fleet. Additionally, uh, the Atlanta County um, Attorney's Office uh, has put the district on notice regarding, regarding a $20 monthly per radio fee that should have been assessed the past few years. Uh, the board solicitor and uh, Ms. Anayer are currently meeting with the county to negotiate an agreement to reduce the charges. For those of you who don't know, our new radios with the interoperability and the, um, the coverage goes through the Atlantic County system, the P25 uh, network system, which is ran by Atlantic County. Um, action items uh, that were discussed. Uh, we're gonna have some action items tonight. I'm sure Ms. Anayer will brief us on those. Uh, Copiers Plus, high school lease, out of travel, uh, district travel, um, parent contracts for student transportation. Um, then we have action items for next week uh, as well that we'll discuss. Uh, we had donations, a donation of 17 boxes of books donated by Books A Million in Mays Landing, uh, estimated value $7,815. Michael Sweeter, EHT School District. We also had a donation of 19 backpacks filled with school supplies donated by Sybil Alabarda. Um, estimated value $300, and that's Dr. Gruccio could probably comment on that um, as well. Uh, we discussed purchases in accordance to policy 621, which is linked to your Google Drive. Um, and there are projects to be presented on September 24th that were not discussed uh, due to time. Partial roof at the high school, five fields at the high school. So that concludes my report. If, if there's any questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Anae at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price, very good. Um, to add to that report, um, the board received the agenda on Friday and had questions um, regarding some of the things we'll be taking on um, action for next week. And in the finance and ops area, there's a bill for payment on um, for our architect for the architectural and engineering um, assessment and work done to, spec to create specifications for the bid um, as we look to at least getting an actual cost for the five fields at the high school. So that work um, has been completed, the specs were done. We did do a bid, we had a bid opening, we are presenting that next week to the full board uh, with more information, but that's the bills list item for the architect and engineer related fees. And that is the end of the questions for my area. Any questions on the actual report or anything else? Any comments or questions on finance, board members? Mrs. Bird. Thank you, I have a question about the chipping paint. Um, do we know why the paint is chipping? Do we have an underlying issue happening or was it, when was the last time it was painted? What, why is it chipping? Age. In summation, That's age. Deep. Right, Doc, I mean, anybody want to add to that? It's, from what I understand, it's just, it has not been painted in a long time. It's just chipping okay. um, from very high up. It's very hard to get to, so it's not something we maintain regularly. Um, because of the height and you know, at this point to remedy it the reason we're getting current pricing is it has been proposed for the past few budgets that's been chipping slowly it has gotten worse um, we will have we now actually do have a lift we actually purchased a lift last year you guys approved it so we actually have one in, in our inventory but to get it done would actually have to be a scraping a sanding and a painting and if you've ever looked up in the gym it's ceilings that are really high so 
Um, the cost at the time, two years ago, was about 200000 So we're trying to get that sharpened and get some more accurate pricing so we can then see how we can move forward and how that would be funded. Very good. Anyone else on finance? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to ask for a motion on 5.2 through 5.4, please. Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, may I have roll call, please? Ms. Alabarda? Yes. Mrs. Bird? It's the first three items only. Oh, somebody's on the mic. If ever <laughs> yes, Mr. Dalabarca. Yes, Mr. Ireland. Yes, Mr. Price. Yes, Mrs. Sullivan. Yes, Mrs. Salagi. Yes, Mrs. Gilbert Floyd. Yes, and Mr. Castellano. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to move into our curriculum area, and I'm going to ask for our curriculum committee report, please. Good evening. The curriculum committee met virtually at 5 o'clock on September 9th, 2021. In attendance was Mr. Della Barca, Mrs. Bird, myself, as well as Dr. Gruscio and Ms. Moss. Agenda items discussed include professional development, field trips for our special education students at the high school, and the action on changes in special education programs as discussed in August. The committee was updated on summer learning enrollment and outcomes, upcoming state assessments, Chromebook distribution, and implementation of Strengthening Gifted and Talented Act. More discussion of this impact will be collaborated on with the teaching staff and continue to be reported out to the board. Finally, there was a discussion about investigating, creating a resolution to work with our university partners on implementing the science of reading in pre-service education. Do you have anything to add to that, Ms. Moss? I do not. Thank you so much. Any uh, questions or comments on curriculum from board members? Okay, seeing none, um, I'm going to need a motion on 6.2 and 6.3, please. Motion. Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Ms. Alabarda? Yes. Mrs. Bird? Yes. Mr. Dallabarca? Yes. Mr. Ireland? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Sullivan? Yes. Mrs. Salagi? Yes. Mrs. Gilbert Floyd? Yes. And Mr. Castellano? Yes. Okay, moving into personnel. Uh, Dr. Charlton, do you have anything for open session? I do not, Mr. President. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have uh, any uh, questions or comments, board members, for open session? Uh, Seeing none, I'm going to ask for a motion on 7.2 through 7.7, .7, please. Motion. Second. Any discussion? May I have roll call? Ms. Alabarda? Yes. Mrs. Bird? Yes. Mr. Delabarca? Yes. Mr. Ireland? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Sullivan? Yes. Mrs. Salagi? Yes. Mrs. Gilbert Floyd? Yes. And Mr. Castellano? Yes. Moving to policy. Um, can we have our policy committee report, please? Yes, thank you. Um, please bear with me. I don't have my glasses, and my report is super long, so I apologize. Um, the policy committee met on Thursday, September 9th. Members present were Mr. Castellano, Mr. Ireland, Mrs. Sullivan, and myself. Admin present were Mr. Santilli, Ms. Anaya, and Dr. Gruccio. And our board solicitor was also present, Ms. Halk Elko. Um, new business consisted of mandated Strauss SMA updates with the following policies and Board of Education approved regulations requiring approval as follows. Policy 6471 and Reg 6471, school district travel, were replacements to EHT's current policy and reg and mandated by Strauss SMA. 
This policy and regulation saw changes to the administrative code sections that were rewritten to align with the State of New Jersey Department of Treasury Office of Management and Budget um, Circular. Policy 2464, Gifted and Talented Students, is also a mandated Strauss SMA alert policy. Uh, it has been updated to better align with the language of New Jersey code, and the revisions include requirements regarding the accessibility and development of the Gifted and Talented Education Program, submission of an annual report to the New Jersey Department of Education, a complaint procedure for individuals who believe the district may have viol violated the code, Notice requirements for the district's policy on gifted and talented education programs. This program, as I stated, is mandated and the policy must be adopted by the board. Policy 1648, Restart and Recovery Plan from June 2020 will be abolished and replaced by policy 1648.11, the Road Forward COVID-19 Health and Safety from uh, June 2021. This is the first of two readings. The new policy aligns with the road forward recommendations regarding safety and health protocols regarding COVID-19 for the opening of schools safely and effectively at the start of the 2021-22 school year. School year. Policy guide 1648.11 is mandated. Policy 1648.02 remote learning options for families will be abolished because of the new road forward plan. Additionally, the committee discussed the regulation, the regulation for class rank. After discussion, the administration will make recommendations related to a name change to the policy and reg, as well as identifying how students will be recognized for their academic achievements. Policy 6421, purchases budgeted, with, budgeted was also discussed by the committee. Information regarding this policy was shared, including how the policy is not required or mandated and is more restrictive than the law requires. It was developed as a way for the business office and the superintendent to remain transparent with the board, whereby the board acknowledges purchases that support the daily operations of the district that were budgeted and seeks approval for those that were not. Lastly, policy 2430 and 31 will be reviewed in October. Um, Oh, policy 1648.13, school employee vaccination requirements. Uh, this is new and this is the first of two readings. This is the Strauss SMA alert policy. On August 23rd, 2021, Governor Murphy signed Executive Order 253, requiring all public school districts, charter schools, parochial school, and private school employees to be fully vaccinated or submit to COVID-19 testing at a minimum of one or two times per week. Executive Order 253 shall be effective October 18, 2021. Strauss Esme has developed Policy Guide 1648.13 to address the vaccination and testing requirements of Executive Order 253. Policy Guide 1648.13 satisfi satisfies the vaccination testing, pol testing policy requirement in Executive Order 253. A school district is required to comply with the provisions of EO 253. Therefore, Policy Guide 1648.13 is mandated. Um, we uh, had to table Policy 2430, co-curricular activities, and Policy 2431, athletic competition, as our meeting ran till 840, well over our one hour limit. We are going to discuss that um, next month in our policy and also we are adding um, the dress code to the policy, our dress code policy to for pre new discussion. Uh, and without my glasses, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job without the glasses. I would have, I couldn't have done I that. I, missed, I think <laughs> I missed one though, did I? Yeah, thank you. You got my back over there. Do we have any questions or comments, board members? Okay. As for this policy um, with vaccination and testing for the staff, um, I, I, I'm hoping that our governor would uh, recognize the fact that people that are vaccinated are still transmitting it to other people and it should not just be for um, staff that is va uh, not vaccinated. It, it needs to be both 
uh, vaccinated and not vaccinated. And I guess we have until the 18th of October to, uh, to hope that change is made. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Okay. Um, so first I'm going to ask for a motion on 8.2 to 8.3. So we, we need to approve those tonight. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Any discussion? And, and just to elaborate, it, it's so that uh, we can get um, these new required uh, road forward policies in place during the month of September. So we'll do first reading tonight, we'll do second reading next week at our regular uh, business meeting. Um, so any discussion on those two? Seeing none, roll call please. Ms. Alabarda? Yes. Mrs. Bird? Yes. Mr. Dallabarga? Yes. Mr. Ireland? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Sullivan? Yes to 8.2, no to 8.3. Thank you. Mrs. Salagi? Yes to 8.2, no to 8.3. Mrs. Uh, Gilbert Floyd? Yes. Mr. Castellano? Yes. Okay. Now to one of the highlights of our evening we are going to introduce our newly hired employees. Dr. Gruccio. And thank you, Mr. Castellano. It's with great pride that I be the first to introduce to you, for the first time in public, the following Egg Harbor Township employees who are new to us based on the Board of Education's vote this evening. So thank you, Board of Education, and please stand Elizabeth Butler, who is a social worker at Davenport. <laughs> Welcome, Brand Shainer, art teacher, part-time at the Swift Slave Ball Complex. <laughs> Allison McShane, a special education teacher at Alder Avenue Middle School. <laughs> Inger Burnside, our data entry specialist. Welcome. <laughs> Lindsay Keeney, a power professional at the Swift Slave Ball Complex. Jennifer Callez, a power professional at the Swift Slave Ball Complex. Morgan Gettings, a program, a PSD program, power professional at the Swift Slave Ball Complex. Welcome. <laughs> Jessica Boots, a ratio power professional at the Miller School. <laughs> Melinda Linville, ratio power professional at the Miller School. Mr. Brian Wright, an MD program power professional at the high school. And Allison Carmen, security guard at the high school. And last but not least, Mr. Tyler Gardner, who has accepted the role of the communication coordinator working out of our TV station and standing right before you. <laughs> Congratulations, everyone, and welcome to Egg Harbor Township School District. Um, at this time, if you would like to um, continue your evening outside of this room, you're more than welcome to exit. Uh, we won't be offended. Um, if you'd like to stay to hear the rest of the meeting, you're more than welcome. Have a great evening, and thanks for attending. Welcome, all of you. Congratulations. Welcome to EHT. I think there's Tuesday night football on, so I don't blame you. All right, so we're going to move forward through the agenda. Um, communications, we have a new board calendar. I do see that we have to choose a uh, committee meeting night uh, in November, but we're going to back that up into the, the final week of uh, October, I assume, because that w is going to conflict with uh, our election day on, on the 2nd, correct? That's correct. The school is closed that first week of November because of election day and the conference and also where we originally, when we built the calendar last year, had that in. So we have to back it up, pushing it forward 
the committees have a choice. If there's a different day they'd prefer, they really do have a choice there if they want to get a different day. But in order for us to have an active work session and talk about things ahead of time, the committee needs to happen first. Okay, so if you can all just take a look at your calendars, um, whether the, you want to look at the draft calendar or your, your private calendars or both, if we, um, so uh, Miss and I is suggesting for us, we have strategic planning on Tuesday, October 26. So she's uh, suggesting that the committees meet on October 27 or 28. Um, if that works for folks, personally, I like the 28 um, so that we get a break. We get a night off. Those of us who work all day, it's nice to. Uh, Mr. President, the 28th is also a uh, Greater Egg Harbor, Great Egg Harbor Historical Society program at the community center that evening on the uh, seven o'clock. So I would prefer the 27th for committee meetings. Okay. Any other thoughts? Mrs. Byrne. Thank you. So um, October 27th, the Wednesday, it might be easier for admin to uh, get the agenda out for the work session on Friday. If we, if we wait till that Thursday, it might be cutting it close for them to get, it might give them just a little bit more time in an already busy um, time. So I'm thinking, I'm leaning towards Wednesday, but I'm flexible either way. Yeah. Any, any other thoughts? Okay, so do you wanna, uh, are we ready to solidify that? It seems like all, all voices are, except for me, are, are for the 27th. Okay, so I'm looking for a little uh, um, straw vote. Looks good, head shake. We're gonna have, uh, we'll have Miss Anaya make up our calendar. We'll reflect Wednesday the 27th of October. Will be our committee meeting night actually will be our November committee meeting night. And then New Jersey School Boards. Mr. Del Barca, what is new and exciting in the world of New Always Jersey School Boards? New, Mr. Uh, it Mr. is, Lana. it's a thrill a minute. Uh, members, good evening everyone. Uh, as president of the County Association, I have some information for you tonight. You should have all received today a, a message from uh, New Jersey School Boards Association's Executive Director, Dr. Feinside, regarding their latest report that they prepared. It's on rebuilding opportunities for students. Uh, it's in his notice that you received today. If you click on the report, it's really an excellent report and includes mental health and other opportunities for uh, ideas for helping kids uh, through the situation that we're living through right now. And they had a state committee prepare this report. I think they did a very nice job on it. Our, just for your information, our Atlantic County School Board meeting, which is hybrid, will be on October 20th, which is a Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, and it's at the Atlantic City Country Club. Of course, uh, you should be receiving information about registering for that meeting shortly. The topic is the creative use of ESSER funding, and we did that at your suggestion when we wanted to have it more timely for the local boards of education. And of course, our virtual workshop for New Jersey School Boards Association is at the same time with all this topic that we just discussed, October 26th through 28th, but you're able to, uh, we are registered and uh, you'll be able to attend virtually and there's also some nighttime programs this time. So uh, pay attention to the, all the notifications that you received almost every day regarding that workshop. Uh, as county president, I attended a, a hybrid meeting last week and Patrick Ireland, one of our vice presidents and uh, Mr. Henry Goldsmith from Weymouth is also the, one of the vice presidents. And the three of us attended a hybrid county meeting in person at Medford Village Country Club, and that was on uh, August 31st. And uh, it was actually a very good meeting. The, uh, we were, the, I think, the largest contingency there representing the Southern New Jersey uh, uh, local associations and county associations. Uh, the executive director, uh, Dr. Feinstein, was there, and he shared the uh, report that I just talked about of rebuilding opportunities for students. and. Uh, he announced that it was coming out this week. It discusses the learning gap and emotional learning, so I think you guys, all of us, would be very interested in this paper. Uh, Mr. Christopher Jones, the Director of Government Relations, shared the latest uh, report from the uh, state level. 
He talked about the governor's mask and vac the governor's mask and vaccinations executive orders, and he talked about phase three of ESSER funding. Um, Ray Penny from school board shared a video from CBS News about a recent Wayne, New Jersey Board of Education meeting. Some of you may have seen that. I think it was about the controversy over masks in schools. And if you would like to uh, view that, he, there, I have the link for that, and you can just contact me and I can share it with you. Uh, then the gist of the whole meeting was how the county associations are going to run hybrid meetings. So I, we were very glad that we were there because we were trained that evening on all the details of how you run a hybrid meeting. And I'm not going to share that with you tonight, but when you come to the county meeting on October 20th, maybe you'll see it, uh, a good performance uh, on our part. I'm sure uh, Patrick and Mr. Goldsmith will give me some suggestions when I mess up somewhere along the evening. But I think the key point for me will be to stay in front of the microphone most of the time because the camera's on that spot the whole time, which I think is really interesting. But they have, what was it, three cameras and three microphones and all kinds of things that they're working out with. The purpose of these local meet, uh, the state meeting with the different parts of New Jersey, they had a North uh, meeting, they had a central, and we were the southern meeting, was to have the county officers understand how the hybrid meetings are to be run. So some pe that evening, most of the people in attendance were actually virtual. The in-person was, uh, was there were 16 of us, I think, virtually there. And the rest of the meeting, there were about 40, 50 people there were virtual. So we have to understand how we run a successful virtual meeting, and we were trained that evening on how to do that. So that was just the gist of that whole meeting, and uh, it was a pleasure to attend, and I'm very honored to have the opportunity to serve the county in this role. Um, and a part of that was I was given a call from Dr. Feinstein about two weeks ago, and the state president, Irene Lefebvre, has appointed me, <laughs> this is really interesting, as a member of the School Boards Association Ethics Committee for the following year. Now, that's a, it's a nice job because I asked how many meetings will I have to attend, and he said, well, they haven't had a meeting in four years because they have very <laughs> few complaints against the, if this is just for school board, the state board members, if there's a concern with their situation. So it's more, a lot more limited than it sounds, but I was just pleased to be appointed. Even they thought of me, and that's nice. It just shows that those of us here in Atlanta County are being recognized at the state level. I think that's a good thing for the county. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Del Barca, and I'll just, just follow up. The New Jersey School Boards Association Legislative Committee will meet this Saturday morning. Uh, I'll be attending, uh, Mrs. Bird and uh, uh, Mr. Ireland as well. And uh, one final thought, um, I want to thank Mr. Del Barca for highlighting all the training that's available as well as the workshop. Remember, one of our board goals is for board members to attain training certification. It's a very important goal. So uh, please take advantage. It, it's easier now to, to get training than it ever was with all of the virtual uh, offerings. Okay, so now with uh, all that being said, we're gonna move to our uh, public comment. We're back fully in person uh, this evening. And so, uh, We'll ask those who wish to comment to please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Um, just as a reminder, um, public comment is three minutes uh, for each person. Um, we, we cannot discuss personnel or litigation. Uh, and if it turns out that a question is very complicated, it may be that someone from our office uh, one of our uh, administration members will need to get back to you with a full answer. So with that, uh, the floor is open. Please come forward. Right here, we'll make sure these mics are on and working. Are we good? You have to push the mic. Yep. There we go. All right, uh, name Dominic Puglisi, 28 Shoreline Road. I'm the father of a high schooler, third grader, and kindergartner. So just to start, I want to say good evening, and I want to start by saying thank you to Dr. Gruscio for meeting with my wife and I earlier this morning, going over a lot of what I'm going to bring up right now. Decided to come tonight, even though we met earlier, so that the frustrations and discussions we had earlier could be brought to a larger audience for awareness. I'll try to touch on just a few of these with the time permitting. 
I'm not sure how many people have thoroughly read Executive Order 251 that covers a lot of the direction regarding the implementation of masks inside schools, but the first line item reads as follows. All public, private, parochial preschool programs in elementary and secondary schools, including charter and renaissance schools, must maintain a policy regarding mandatory use of face masks by staff, students, and visitors in the indoor portion of the school district premises, except in the following circumstances, and it follows with eight bullet points, which I'm not gonna delve into all of them. When you view the EHT school district website, slide presentations, and other media, the word policy is omitted, and it claims that the order reads as master mandatory. I asked for specifically where in the order it's stated, and I was told it's in there. The order reads that a policy regarding mandatory use of face masks must be maintained, which is vastly different than the way EHC is interpreting it. This is why other schools within our district, example, Atlantic Christian, as well as other school districts are able to have a more flexible mask policy for the students because that's how they developed it. Our policy regarding mandatory use of masks could read that masks are mandatory where social distancing can't be practiced or when navigating through hallways or anything similar and still meet the mandate set forth by the governor. Expanding on this, EHC has decided to implement desk and table shields in some classrooms, as Dr. Grishow brought up earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. When you read the road forward on the EHT school district website, it gives guidance into when desk shields would be used, when the class size is over 20, and when social distancing of three feet can't be enforced. If you look at some of the classes, my third grader, for example, they have social distancing over three feet between a desk and yet the shields are still present. When I asked about this earlier, I was told it could be up to the discretion of the teacher as well if they felt they wanted it. There's no guidance in the executive order or really anywhere regarding the implementation of desk shields within a classroom. And I got concurrence on this from the assistant superintendents during our meeting. EHC took it upon themselves to implement this and there's no consistency amongst the schools with my kindergartner not having it and my third grader having them. Um, we don't need to do this per the executive order or any other directive. Mass breaks are one area of contention as well that was brought up with no consistency between classrooms, current recommendations for a child to raise their hand, essentially interrupting class to request a mass break, which may or may not be given, or they'll be asked to leave the classroom to take one. I feel this is an area that could give some additional attention to, maybe implement something like X amount of minutes per hour of instruction or something similar to alleviate the added burden of a child having to draw attention to his or herself and potentially put them in an uncomfortable position. I was gonna address some items on the water fountains, which we discussed earlier, but Dr. Grishio gave some uh, insight that they would be reopening, which is great to hear. Lastly, I do wanna address the bus um, situation that came up as that was our neighborhood that received uh, the phone call from transportation said 70 students, um, 12 of which were in the preschool. So that leaves 58 K through three on a 53 person bus. Um, I know it was said that a substitute bus driver was present. Um, however, my children were the ones involved in that and they did not know the little girl that could not find a seat. So while I appreciate what's being done, I think some extra attention towards the bus and the safety of the students would be great. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm gonna, there, there's a lot there. Uh, I'm gonna defer over to both Dr. Guccio and um, to Ms. Hauk Elko to touch on that. That's, um, so the, the, the mask, the executive order is very clear um, and I'm just, I'm just going to let Dr. Guccio as well as Ms. Hauk Elko um, respond to the various items raised. As Mr. Puglesi um, stated, I did cover um, those items in my opening. I believe more clarification is uh, needed from Ms. Hauk Elko regarding the executive order. Perhaps you can explain it in a different way and then um, I'll answer the bus or clarify the bus situation. I would just say in regards to the executive order, the executive order is clear in that it does say the district has to have a policy, but that policy is for mandatory mask use. And that is for staff, students, and visitors in the indoor portion of the school district. And it only accepts out for very limited circumstances. Those have been shared, I know, by the district previously, but that is if someone's health is at stake, 
if they have trouble breathing, if they have a documented medical condition. And for all of those instances, that person has to provide a doctor's note to the school district, provide a, answer a form as well by their doctor, and then our school doctor looks at it to determine if there's an exemption. In addition, there's also an exemption if someone is under the age of two, if someone is engaged in an activity that cannot physically be performed while wearing a mask, such as eating or drinking, which Dr. Perchio did explain tonight, playing a musical instrument that would be obstructed by a face mask, or if an individual is engaged in a high intensity aerobic or anaerobic activity, or when a student is participating in a high intensity physical activity during a physical education class in a well-ventilated location and able to maintain physical distance of six feet from all other individuals, or when wearing a face mask creates an unsafe condition in which to operate equipment or execute a task. That's it, those are the limited exceptions that the executive order provides. Dr. Bridget, did you wanna add anything? Um, no, thank you, that's um, what we're following. Regarding the bus situation of 58 students, I'll clarify again. We had five buses going into the community to be more effective and efficient. We, there are 70 students, um, some are preschool, some aren't taking the bus. We are down to 58 students. Two buses will bring 58 students to our schools. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. You said yes, and then you looked away. I didn't know if you wanted an affirmation. There are two buses in that community at this time, yes. Even with moving in, I want to be very clear, there were never 58 scheduled to be on a 54 passenger bus. There were seats for every student. We pulled video, there were seats. Yes, factually, there were four small children on one 36 inch seat. They were not hanging over, it's not okay. There's a substitute bus driver did not adhere to the seating chart. However, in the same video, there were seats with just two on a 36 inch seat. So there were seats for them. I don't know how it ended up with four on one with a substitute driver. They're small, maybe the driver couldn't see their heads. Since then, the sub driver has been spoken to and it has been remedied. But I wanna make sure everybody understands, we do not overbook buses. That's just not what happens. Thank you. And uh, if, there's, if we just would like to reiterate what we're doing with the desk shields. Desk shields are in place in classrooms. Um, where there's 20 or more students. Desk shields are in place where we cannot social distance three feet. Desk shields are in place um, at teacher's request. Desk shields are in place in cafeterias where students are um, gathering, eating for up to 30 minutes and uh, need to take off their masks to eat their food. For the safety of our students and staff. Okay, anyone else please come forward. Give us your name and address for the record. Hi, I'm Dawn Berg, Sycamore Ave, Egg Harbor Township. I'm Jersey. sorry, if you can use a microphone, I couldn't hear you. Oh, is it on? Dawn Bird, Sycamore Ave, Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey. And I just wanted to ask about homeschooled middle schoolers playing in sports. I was a little confused as to what the policy is. I called the school um, the school nurse said, surely it would not be legal to not allow my daughter to play sports. I spoke with um, coaches, guidance counselors. Everyone was like, yes, yeah, just fill out the paperwork. She was all registered to go. Yesterday at two o'clock, right before the soccer tryouts, I was called and said, whoops, sorry, we were all mistaken. She can't come. So obviously I had a very upset little girl. So I'm just wondering, even the high school guidance counselors are like, what? How is that possible? It's allowed to happen here. Why is there a disconnect through the middle school? So I was told it's being worked on. So I was just wondering, is it being worked on? Is there a plan? Is there a date? Is there something I can do to make this happen if, I don't have to, if she doesn't have to take transportation? Is there a way to get something going? I can answer that with, um, very simply. So. When we put the policy in place, um, it was, at the time, it was um, at the request of high school parents mm -hmm. and 
uh, prior to that, it was uh, several years ago now. Um, so we put it in place as a trial, and we do, we do believe that homeschoolers should participate in, in our activities. Um, we wrote it as a trial just for high school students at the time because that was, uh, we only had interest from right. two, high, two high school families. Um, at our last regular meeting, we had uh, someone make the uh, request that we extend it to middle school, mm -hmm. which uh, our policy committee is in the process of doing. We okay. looked at it last meeting and our administration is looking to make sure that there aren't any other roadblocks that we're not familiar with um, and making sure that uh, everything is good to go and we do want to extend it down to include middle school. Okay. Um, it's just where you know where we are in the school year if we had gotten a request this spring yeah. we could have altered the policy over the summer and had it in place mm. for the fall so we're going to get it changed as quickly as we're able uh, to do that is okay. does anything mrs bird you'd like to add i would just like to add that hopefully in the future when questions like this come um, at the school level that it's brought to the right people so that the question can be answered correctly so that we don't have students who are let down um, so for you my know, sake, who should have I have asked? You know what I mean? Is that what you're right. saying? Like so, I should have asked somebody? No, no. Um, oh. We have policies in place, and if there's questions, then oh. there's a chain of command that staff members go through oh, okay. to make sure that the answers that are given out, and I don't want to overstep my role here, mm -hmm. but um, I apologize that that happened to you for your child because the last thing any of us want ever is to disappoint a child. Yeah. Thank you. Is there like a goal date or not right now? It's just you guys are working on it like as soon as? There, there's there's no reason, you know, in, unless there's some issue that presents itself, we should be able to approve it in, at our October meeting and then these activities will be open to middle schoolers. Awesome, that's awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Yes. So I just have a question for that policy since it's brought, been brought up. Can we administration look at ex exception to policy possibly for individuals that already put their paperwork in, got to the very last step, and then at the very last step told no? Um, is there an exception to policy from administration policy possibly? That's a good question because like in October, her season will have already you know, already played out. It's not like she can try out then. You know All right, right, so let's, okay, so, uh, and I appreciate that, but let's try not to be, you know, sort of yelling. We want to keep, I'm sorry. you know, that's, that, that's, that's okay. Um, and, and I don't want to put, I don't want to put administration on, you know, on the spot. Um, we were not aware that there was an interest in this at the middle school level until just, very very recently at our last meeting and we put it on our policy our very next policy committee to get the process moving to change the policy to allow it to happen we moved as quick as we could so i said if 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 someone had approached us you know earlier that there was an interest at the middle school level we would have moved to make the change sooner we we want to make it happen um, so, you know, oh, let me go to Mrs. Sullivan. I'm wondering if we can cover, uh, I think we have a couple more bases to touch on that. I was um, just a visitor at the policy meeting and we didn't get to this policy. Uh, if we can get some clarity from administration this week, would any of the board members be opposed to putting it on next week and getting it approved? You know, Mr. Santilli um, facilitated the policy meeting, and um, we were taking it into consideration. We have some I's to dot and T's to cross, um, and it would be communicating with the administration of the middle school. So once that's done, I'm not opposed to um, bringing it to the board um, once we have all the I's dotted and T's crossed. But at a courtesy to the administration, I'd like for that conversation to occur first. Agreed. Okay. 
So everybody good with that? As, as soon as we can make that happen, we'll, we'll make that happen. Um, you, you know, I, I just wish that, uh, I, I wish we had known um, the district and a lot of districts don't allow it. Um, but we, we were approached several years ago, um, again, by high school parents and we made the change because we thought it was the right thing to do. Um, we just limited the high school again because there was only interest at the high school level. We want to try it out and see how it worked. It seems to have worked very well from all that I know. So, um, you know, I think he, we came up against the very, it, it coming to us at the very, very end of the summer, beginning of school year, and we all, we got, we got jammed up. So, <laughs> you know, we're going to get it. We're going to get it done as as quickly as we can, you know, through the prop through the proper channels. Um, and I, you know, normally we don't do board members, but I'm gonna. We, we normally wait for board member comment, but I'll go ahead and let Mrs. Bird as policy chair. Thank you. And I do just want to reiterate that, uh, like I said, our policy committee meeting did run almost 40 minutes over, and from my report. You know, we had a lot of mandated things because of COVID and, and, you know, to deal with. We definitely discussed that policy. It's on our radar for sure, but we did direct administration. We asked them to please gather the information because there are factors involved and we can't just make knee-jerk reactions. So we didn't, we didn't say, oh, we'll deal with it later for sure. It was more we came up with a plan as quickly as we could so that we could deal with it. So please know that is something we're taking seriously. We want to provide opportunities to our community members, whether they're homeschooled or in, you know, in more of a traditional setting. So uh, please understand. And had we um, not had so many other policies to deal with that were mandated that we had no choice of, we would have had the time and, and, and had a better answer for you uh, sooner. So um, so we, we, we're doing our best to get it off, to fit it all in limited time. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments from the audience? Yes, please. Hi, Regina Bongiorno, 405 Starfish Lane. Um, as far as the mask breaks go, there's definitely a discrepancy amongst all of the schools. Um, I guess what the policy reads is that we're trying to allow the children to take the mask breaks as needed. Um, I would like to see if we could do something more uniformed um, as far as having, like the gentleman said before me, m like five minutes in every class um, to have a child raise their hand and interrupt a class during maybe the teacher is doing a lesson um, to say that they need a mask break seems like it would interrupt the day or the teacher or the teacher might feel like she has a lot to cover he or she might have a lot to cover and is unable to get to a mask break um, so I know that some children go all day with really no mask break other than lunch and if they're not eating their lunch then they're sitting there still with their masks on and that just seems like we do need to we need as adults need mask breaks so I feel like if we could have more of a uniformed across the district every principal every administration put it out to every teacher so that everyone's kind of on the same page. Um, and as far as the high intensity, I know as far as working out, if your heart rate is going up, that's high intensity. And what might be high intensity for me is not high intensity for someone else. How can a gym teacher direct that in a gym class <laughs> when they're playing inside this gym where they can social distance over six feet? Why would they be required to keep their masks on? regardless if they're only doing jumping jacks or playing volleyball because we have rainy days, we're gonna get colder weather, the kids are gonna be in school in the gym wearing masks and might not be getting the exercise that they need because we're trying to keep masks on them. So if we can separate them and remove the masks for that period and allow them to work out and do the activity, um, I don't see any harm in that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to let uh, Dr. Guccio speak to the mass. We, we obviously want to be as flexible as we possibly can with our breaks. And I'll let Dr. Guccio take it. 
I believe we've been very flexible with, with the mask breaks, um, just like with bathroom breaks. If a child needs one, even as if it's a simple um, to step out, they, you know, teachers have even told students that, you know, they even have to raise their hand if they just need a break, you know, some classes, that's how um, it's, it's being handled. Other teachers are taking them to certain areas, um, and this seems to be working well. In terms of a child going through a whole day without a mask break, um, I don't, I don't know why, why that occurred because anyone who needs one uh, should take one. Um, what was the other question? In terms of oh, the high intensity activity, yeah, if, if we can maintain six feet social distance in that, that area, you know, we, we said it's okay to take the mask off. And right now a lot of our activities are outside and they don't have the masks on. Um, I'm going to call on Ms. Moss um, because she's been in the schools as well and has uh, worked on researching mass breaks and asking teachers and, and principals what's going on. Do you have a comment? If you don't, did, did I cover it? That's fine. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you felt I covered it based on the research we looked into over the last couple of days, I know you've been looking into it. No, I think you covered it and we appreciate the comments and we will continue to have these discussions to ensure that all students are receiving mass breaks um, and we, we address the phys ed and the separation with the six feet for that as well. So we're continuing to work through this to, again, keep us, everyone in school in the health and safety and make sure that it is equitable across the board. Okay, very good. Anyone else? Oh, go ahead. You're closer. Hi. Okay. Kathy Wazen, president of the Egg Harbor Township Education Association. I want to speak on behalf of the staff. Um, we um, appreciate the mandate from the governor. We are concerned about our health as well as we, we are concerned about our students' health. Um, as far as the petitions, the barriers, um, the teacher has to remain safe in that classroom, uh, especially on the elementary level. These children are not vaccinated. So it's also for the safety of the teacher. So she's healthy, he's healthy, and he can come in, and she can come in every day and teach these children. So I just want to keep this prevalent, that this is all for the safety of our students and our staff. And even though we're frustrated and overwhelmed with having to wear these masks and have the shields, it's not to punish anybody. It's to keep us safe. I just want to speak to mask breaks. I walk the hallways. I talk to teachers all the time. I see kids taking breaks. They take breaks. They make sure their students get a break. Um, you know, I think it's, it's time that we stop the name calling and the pointing out and start working together through this pandemic so we can be finished with it. The more we complain about masks and barriers being put up, the more this pandemic is gonna go on. So um, I appreciate the parents' comments tonight, but I have to stand here for the staff and their protection as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wazen. Thank you, Mrs. Wazen. I couldn't have said it better myself. Appreciate that. Anyone else, please? All right. Uh, Stardust Santiago, three Golden Court. Um, in caveat to what she said, um, I don't agree with masks. I've already made that clear in the last meeting. Second is the policy of wearing masks in gym when they're doing high tech intensity or anaerobic activity, high bursts intensity. And I don't know about any of you guys if you played volleyball recently and whether or not you feel it's high intensity. Yoga, maybe low intensity. All right, we'll go with that. But to make our children wear masks indoors while performing high intensity activities or anaerobic activities is against the policy. It's, in, it's included in the exclusion. And with you guys violating that, you guys are going to call attention to the school board and you're going to call attention to litigation. So with that being said, that's number one. Number two, it should not be the student's responsibility to make sure that the teachers are healthy. It is the teacher's responsibility to make sure that they are healthy. They have a school board who are protecting them. It is the parent's responsibility to protect the students. And at this point, 
it's not uniform. You have one school who doesn't have air conditioning in their gym, Fernwood. You have another school, Alder, who says they don't have air conditioning in their gym, and they're still making their students wear masks. That's against one of the other exclusions, which is ventilation. Circulating air that's already contaminated with COVID, quote unquote, um, is not the same as ventilation, especially if you have no clean air coming in. So with that being said, like you guys are just only following the directives and the exclusions that you feel like following. And that being said, it's not part of the EO. You're not following it to the letter of the law. You're not even following it to the spirit of the law at this point. So with that being said, I do think that we need to really uniform it in the school bus situation, because I can attest to that. There were kids sitting on the floor on the school bus, on my, my, student, my child's school bus. And I don't know what community he lives in, but that wasn't just one school bus, and that wasn't just one community. That was my community, too. So, good luck. Well, before I turn it over to Dr. Cruccio and to uh, Ms. Hauk, I'll go. I'll just tell you flat out, we're following the executive order. You're not. And we're following the You're policies. Not. Yes, we are. So we've already gone over what the executive order requires with exceptions. I believe that is what the district is following. And I believe Dr. Gruccio has said that she continues and will continue to go over with staff to make sure that they clearly understand those expectations. Anything, Doc? No, as far as school buses, uh, we've addressed that, uh, the situations, anyone that's bringing to our attention. Sean, John, I don't know if you had any, any more specific information because you oversee the transportation department and whenever I get an email or a phone call, I send it to you and, um, and Ms. Fisher uh, to look into it um, in terms of kids sitting on the floor over crowded buses. I know you have information on that. If it's the same bus that was circulating Facebook, it was not true. However, I will follow up with your student's bus specifically and follow up with you tomorrow personally. Thank you. Anyone else, please? Eric New, High School Drive. Can you guys hear me all right? If you can hit the microphone, please. Eric Newcomer, High School Drive. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, I'm just curious as to the um, testing policy for teachers weekly or biweekly. Um, we're in a very deadly pandemic here, highly contagious, new strands are coming out. We're, te we're only testing the faculty weekly or biweekly, or the students as well. I'm just trying to follow the logic. Should we not be testing every single student weekly or twice a week? I'm just, just trying to follow the logic behind that. Thank you. Thank you, we appreciate that. And again, we're, we're we're following our executive order. I'm going to let Ms. Halcalco just go through that again. Sure. Under Executive Order 253, the district is required to test weekly or biweekly unvaccinated staff starting October 18th. The district, like many districts, received a survey from the state of New Jersey. From that survey, we'll get information as to how the testing will be implemented through the state of New Jersey. Once we have that information, we'll be able to share it with the Board of Education and the public as to that policy. Very good. I just want to clarify, right now that policy is only for staff members though. Anyone else, public comment, questions or comments? Yes. Regina Bongiorno, 405 Starfish Lane. Sorry, I didn't want to have a go back and forth. If you can please use a microphone, thank you. Regina. Oh, sorry, Regina Bongiorno, 405 Starfish Lane. I didn't want to have a back and forth. So as far as the masks in gym, um, again, we're going back and forth on this topic. My son was in gym class with the volleyball during the, the other day when it was raining, playing volleyball with a mask on. And I feel with a gym class that I'm pretty sure the last time I was in a gym, it's pretty big and we can space out. if. We're making our children wear masks when they're spaced out and there's no ventilation. I know personally, I wouldn't give my all. <laughs> I wouldn't want to work out with a mask on. So I'm just trying to figure out where can we compromise? Where can we find that 
barrier here to like make it a little bit more possible to have a activity in school I and mean, we're allowed to social distance without our masks on right like if the teachers can't go outside. They're able to go to the auditorium or to the cafeteria or in the hallway, space out and take off their masks. So why wouldn't they be able to do that in gym and remove their masks? And I know that you may be checking into it and checking with the teachers and principals, but <laughs> I spoke with the gym teacher last night during back to school night and asked that question as well. And she said that she's been directed to follow the executive order. So. It just seems like they we're missing pieces of the puzzle here. Like some people are interpreting one way, they're doing, you know, being extra cautious, which I understand. I don't knock it at all. I'm, everyone wants to be safe. That's the agenda here, but we have to have common sense. And if the executive order has an exemption in there, I think we should be using it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Doc. Yeah, as I stated before, we will continue to look into it and specifically the Fernwood Avenue physical education situation. I mean, some, you know, classes have 40 kids, some have 80, some have 100. I, you know, I have to look at the specific situation and we'll bring clarity, uh, give clarity to um, the order to the principals and the uh, supervisor of health and phys ed. Very good. Okay, anyone else? I'm going to go to uh, then board members. Anything? Questions, comments? Mr. Ireland. So thank you for everybody coming out. Um, I agree with a, a gentleman that spoke up earlier during public session about the um, testing requirements for the staff or students, but that is directly what we have from the executive order. It doesn't make sense that we're only testing teachers or, or our staff that are only um, non-vaccinated because people can carry it if you are vaccinated. So, but unfortunately, I believe that is the only part of the executive order, if I'm mistaken on that, Ms. Halkelko. I believe that is what the guidance that we got, even though it doesn't make sense to the myself. Exec the executive order is specifically for staff in regards to whether they're vaccinated or not vaccinated. Uh, Any other board I have members? A, a comment, Mr. Price. Go ahead, Mr. Price. When we get into testing and so on and so forth and uh, vaccinations, um, it's going to be required for the employees to either be vaccinated or be tested. That's covered, you know, with funds. But the other thing would be if we did test everybody, including kids and everything, who would fund that and who would pay for that? And that's that's something that we would need to, you know, take into consideration as well and, and how you would implement something like that. And, and would, the, um, would the CARES funding uh, or the state in this case, which is recommending a couple of options, I mean, w w is that something that they would fund at this point? I don't think they would because they're only going to fund what the executive order specifically says as far as I know. So that, that's just what I wanted to comment on. Any other board members? Okay, seeing, seeing Mrs. Goober Floyd. Um, I am thankful that, you know, we did have people, parents come out, teachers, staff members come out tonight um, to express their um, opinions and concerns. And there was a lot of information that was shared um, that I think um, some of it we've heard before, some of it's new. Um, but I definitely wanted to say the fa I, I'm glad that we're back in school five days in person instruction for the health and social emotional well being of our students. I think um, we could start there by saying that um, that was a task and a feat that was um, accomplished. Um, and I think that's great for the children. And along with that, of course, it comes with the different, um, you know, first we, we weren't in school and, you know, everyone went to school open five days a week and we got there. And we can't be open five days a week without some type of precautions put in place because we are 
still in a pandemic. Whether some people think a pandemic is real or not, we're still in a pandemic um, with different variants of um, COVID running rampant. Um, and I think that um, the one thing I did hear a lot about was mass breaks and discussing having a universal mass break within the schools. Um, our district is K to 12. Um, so a universal mass break is kind of like telling the kids, you know, people say, don't tell, you can't tell my kid when they need to use the bathroom. <laughs> Sometimes each child may not need a mass break at the same time, right? Um, so I think the way that you have it with the, you know, in the classrooms, making sure that these children are provided that opportunity. And I can say that um, when Ms. Watson spoke about the fact that, the, you know, the teachers, I don't know teachers that would, would deny a child a, a mass break or, you know, say, hey, listen, you know, tough it out and they will give the child the mass break. I think that's one, one plus. Um, and Ms. Bongiorno said some, two things tonight that I thought, comments that I thought really fit with the situation that we're in. Um, and one word she used was interpretation. And the other one was common sense. And I think if they're, they're great things, but I think interpretation is the reason why Ms. Ms. Wisen stated that, you know, we're here pointing, you know, sometimes we point fingers and what we need to be doing is using common sense and working together. We're very thankful that our kids are back in school and um, we have to work through the different executive orders. And I think, you know, at the end of this meeting, tomorrow, the next day, I think we're still gonna have people with different opinions, um, interpretations, and what their idea of what common sense looks like because we view it from our lens and our life experiences. Your interpretation of something um, your idea of common sense or whoever is, is going to be totally different because we've all had different experiences. But the bottom line is that our children are back in school and we do have to consider the safety and health and well-being of the staff and the students. And I think that um, we just need to look at it from, from that venue. And like Ms. Wazen just said, more of a collaborative effort because we're going to have to agree to disagree. That's really going to be the bottom line. And I always say, <clears throat> You know, we're our children's first teachers. So we teach our children how to behave by the way we behave too. So just keep that in mind when you come out. And I am glad that, to see that people expressed their opinions and gave their comments in such a respectful manner. Um, so that was pleasant to hear. Because like I said, we can agree to disagree, but your delivery was, was much better than some previous meetings. So I appreciate that. And that's all. Thank you. Any other board members? Mrs. Sullivan. My personal opinion um, doesn't affect anybody on the board. We all have our own personal opinions, as well as the uh, community has their personal opinions. Uh, I really want to commend our district with being forerunners. Our administration has done everything to the letter that they can to protect the students and the staff. Uh, with this pandemic. But to tell you the truth, following the science doesn't really answer it because we have people that have the vaccine that are getting COVID. Um, it doesn't change anything getting the vaccine as in school because we could have 100% vaccine uh, employees and they're all gonna still have to wear masks. They're still gonna have to um, socially distance. So right at this point, our staff is doing the best they can. Our administrators, I really have to commend, but um, according to the guidelines we have right now, there's just no answer to this thing. There's no common sense answer to all of it because you have people that are vaccinated and infecting others. You have others that don't have vaccines and they've never gotten sick. Um, and then you have all the students, nobody under 12. So that's a whole population that we're dealing with that is never, well, I shouldn't say never, that is not in the foreseeable future gonna be taking these vaccines. So I think we all just need to be patient, um, work with our administrators and our, our staff and just do the best we can. That's all we can say. Thank you, anyone else? Yes, please. Um, Mrs. Burke. You make such good points, uh, Ms. Sullivan. 
I think that uh, that's why we call this a pandemic because the rate of spread is greater than how we can pro, you know, keep people safe. That's why it's a pandemic. That's why we have to take these added steps of making sure that our ventilation systems are safe, that we're wearing masks properly, that we're socially distancing, that we have dividers in our classrooms, that when we're outside of school, we're encouraging the social distancing, we're not going to large groups. It's not because of what we believe. It's not because science isn't working. It isn't because of common sense. It's because we are in a pandemic. And to fight the pandemic, we're using the resources we have. And we're following the rules, and the rules are changing every day. And it's exhausting. But we have to do our best and hopefully prevent as uncomfortable as a mask is, a ventilator is way more uncomfortable. So we have to just continue to do our best and look out for each other and hope and pray that we can get back to normal and take these masks off. Just take them off. At some point. But we're not there yet because we're still in this pandemic, unfortunately. Anyone else, board members? Any other comments? Administration? All right, so a very good meeting. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, as Mrs. Gilbert Floyd said, thank you for the uh, polite comments. Um, very much appreciate it all. Um, welcome back. We'll see you next Tuesday for our uh, business meeting, our September business meeting. So uh, have a great evening, and I'm going to ask for uh, a motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. We are adjourned.